Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Brigham, the president and CEO at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And it is our great pleasure to be hosting a conversation today uh, called Provenance is Paramount, Stenton at HSP, between Laura Kine, the curator at Stenton, and Lee Arnold, the director of library and collections and uh, chief operating officer at HSP. Uh, it's a great moment for us to be hosting this uh, conversation as we begin to contemplate the celebration of the 200th anniversary of HSP in 2024, because uh, the Logan family and the Penn family uh, were very much uh, motivators in uh, the founding of our institution, preserving the history uh, between those two families. And uh, a committee was formed within months of the creation of HSP, consisting of Roberts Vox, Charles Ingersoll, and Isaac Norris, to visit Deborah Logan uh, about, quote, the manuscript correspondence of William Penn and James Logan, which she has collected and arranged in order for its publication by this society. So really, in our founding moment, um, uh, the Logans and the Penns were, were very much on the minds of our founders. Uh, Stenton is a very important uh, historic house and museum in uh, Germantown, and uh, it, it uh, is currently and has been for over a century uh, under the protection and uh, guidance of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. And uh, we also are happy, in addition to welcoming the Colonial Dames, uh, to welcome members and descendants of the Logan family. Um, we also want to thank the Connolly Foundation uh, for helping us purchase the equipment that makes a conversation like this uh, possible. Uh, and those purchases were made in the context of the COVID pandemic. So uh, we're always looking for silver linings, and this is one of them. This talk and this conversation would not be possible without those acquisitions. So now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Dr. Lee Arnold. Hello and welcome, and I certainly want to extend a welcome to Laura Kine at Stenton and to all of you out there watching this Facebook uh, live presentation. And let me encourage you to also put any questions that you have in the Q&A box uh, for us as we go along. So uh, welcome, Laura. Thanks, Lee. Well, um, Stenton is really excited to be here today. And um, this, the idea for this program came about in large measure because it would not, it absolutely would not be possible for us to interpret Stenton as we do without all the historical knowledge that lives here at HSP in the papers so that we um, you know, literally know kind of how the house was built um, as well as a lot about the lives of people that were there. And I wanted to um, just briefly take a moment to orient you to Stenton just in case you may not be familiar with it. And I'm showing you a map of Germantown. And so you can see um, uh, Philadelphia, kind of that red bit down in the center. This is a 1777 map. Um, and I'm not sure how well these lines are going to show up for you on the screen, but pointing to the junction of the York and the Germantown roads um, in the bottom of, of Germantown there. And there's a, a line drawn to Logan, and that house is Stenton. And if you follow up the Germantown road, you see this row of buildings along, um, along the Great Road. And that is the village where a collector we're going to talk a bit about today, John Fanning Watson lived in the um, early 19th century. Stenton today is a small bit, um, just two and a half acres administered by the Colonial Danes within the larger city Stenton Park, but was in um, the builder's time, James Logan's time, a 511 acre plantation that then expanded by a couple hundred more acres. And to some degree, Stenton um, as a house museum offers what you might expect, but here we have, um, collections and largely Norris and Logan family things, some in our collections, um, some on loan from other um, organizations and the looking glass in this view actually um, was left to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania by um, Mariah Dickinson Logan. And we have um, our yellow lodging room. This is a best bedchamber, a recent recreation and restoration. And now routinely take visitors to the third floor, to the middle garret 
a space where um, enslaved workers certainly slept. And this ledger we're about to look at um, has really told us um, a lot of new information about um, slavery at Stenton in the 1720s um, period and, and beyond. So um, just very briefly, our new research is kind of reorienting. We probably tended to see the house as um, James Logan kind of at the center with now additional characters more functioning in a constellation. And for today's purposes, um, these were kind of the primary characters in our little presentation, the house itself. James Logan, we're gonna look at um, his 1720s ledger book and his walking purchase map today. Um, and then um, Dinah, a uh, once enslaved woman who um, was in the second generation, James Logan's son, William, and uh, daughter, Hannah Emlyn, owned Dinah. She's freed in 1776 and in 1777 saved the house from burning by British soldiers. And you're looking actually at a detail of a plaque you'll see later. And the memory maker of the house, the third generation, Deborah Norris Logan, married to Dr. George Logan, her diaries, pocket almanacs, um, memoirs and transcriptions of earlier Logan and Norris papers, many of the, these things are all at HSP now. Um, and her friend, John Fenning Watson, the um, cashier at the Bank of Germantown, the collector, and we're also going to look at some of his annals and manuscripts today, including the first known image of Stenton. Um, and then there, the Danes paper, some of the Danes papers are here at HSP as well. So first we're going to turn to the ledger and um, just some, just a tiny little bit of the evidence for the building of Stenton. So this 1720 to 27 ledger is the only ledger known. And I keep waiting for a 1730s ledger to come um, out from under somebody's bed or trunk or attic. So if you happen to be um, watching and have something like that and hiding in your own family papers, you know, we're always looking on the hunt. Um, but I'm gonna just come forward and show you this plantation house account where um, one of the things listed is the pay payment. Um, Thomas Hart laid 46,550 bricks uh, and that entry cost 24 pounds 10. Um, underneath is labor for work done, only four pounds. Um, and then John Skull, who um, was paid for 360 bushels of lime at 15 pounds. So in the 18th century, the labor was inexpensive, the materials were very expensive. Um, and on the other side, so this, this um, ledger book functions in such a way, we just, need to slide a little, that um, the, two, the pages have the same number. The account runs across um, in terms of notation and, and payment. Um, and on this side, we can see an entry that also tells us for certain that enslaved labor was used to build Stenton. Cash paid Clement Plumstead for the hire of his Negroes, four pounds, seven shillings, six pence. So um, we continue to, as I say, learn, learn new things every time we come back to this document. And um, while well, Lee's going to turn the page actually to an earlier account in the book, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, this, how fragile this book actually is. And some of the pages are, are no longer held by the binding. And so HSP does have an adopt a collection um, program if anyone might be interested in helping to see this both be conserved and digitized so it doesn't have to be handled as much. But even in saying that we need digital um, scans and photographs to turn to, you can never replace the experience of turning the pages of the book. And every generation does need to do this for themselves. And I had a, an experience today where I was looking at Stenton's historic structures report from the early 1980s. And the, the, um, I wanted to find that same reference to the number of bricks and the page number is wrong. And I don't know if um, they didn't account for the using the same number on two pages or why it's off and it's not divisible by half. I just got lucky and found the page number for today. So 
Um, but, but then turning earlier, that HSR, again, that 1982 Historic Structures Report has an appendix in the back that lists the enslaved and indentured workers at Stenton for the first two generations. And an entire group um, is missing from the HSR. And right here we have the account of Negroes um, beginning in 1720 and the cash paid for a Negro boy, Jack, and a Negro girl, Araminia, 42 pounds, 13 shillings, four pence. Account of stock for Annabel, whom we also know is, known, is called Hannibal. Mingo, Diana, and Ben, 100 pounds. To Samuel Preston, who is the, um, a fellow Quaker, and a married um, an in-law of James Logan's and fellow merchant, um, Samuel Preston for the duty of Jack and Aramina, and Preston built Bel Air, which some of you may know in um, Passyunk in JFK Park. Cash paid Joseph Jones of Carolina for Jack or John at Plantation, and to Brother Reed, that's his brother-in-law, um, his wife's brother, for duty of said Negro. And I just want to say as well that we when we have the documents, we do use um, historical terminology that we certainly wouldn't be using today. Um, but this is a staggering sum. And I think just even reading all of that, it's a very heavy commentary on Quakers and slavery in early Pennsylvania. Uh, and so I think we'll maybe pull out the walking purchase oh, next. Wonderful, great. So this walking purchase that we're about to pull out is um, an extraordinary document as well. And one that um, James Logan himself commissioned for his own collection. And um, the walking purchase was a historical event happening in 1737. Um, and the map was made kind of commemoratively and to sort of Mark the mark the happening and um, in 1738, the map maker is Lewis Evans, um, cartographer, and it's actually labeled up in the top left quadrant. And I'm, we are all learning how to use this equipment and place these objects. So I hope that the views are coming through and you're you're seeing what you want. Um, but la the label in the top left corner um, describes it a map of that part of Bucks County, so north of Philadelphia, released by the Indians to the proprietaries of Pennsylvania in September 1737, as by former agreement made with said the said Indians by the extent of a man's walk in a day and a half from thence by a right line to Delaware River. And this is a watercolor, um, watercolor and brown ink, and it's part of the core, kind of core Mm -hmm. Logan Papers collection. It's a wonderful map. I, I, I'm a, what's called a map head. I love maps and certainly historic maps. And it really tells visually it's so beautiful. Um, what's happening, of course, is very heavy and very grave about, uh, you know, uh, not treating the native uh, um, Lenny Lenape uh, with dignity and, uh, and respect by, by taking the land. But as a document, it's just really wonderful. And it's, it's so... Um, uh, exemplifies what HSP endeavored to do, which is to really to collect the documents of the founding of certainly of Pennsylvania. And with our Penn family papers and uh, an earlier actual deed with the Lenny Lenape for parts of Bucks County, this extends that land that they actually first paid for and, and this happened. Um, we, we can really start to document the founding of, of of, of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And then later on, as we go, of course, the founding of our nation. So supposedly, um, <clears throat> there had been some treaties in um, in the late 17th century, which ceded this land kind of just west of the Delaware River. So you're all seeing mm -hmm. that coming down here um, and the mountains sort of nicely um, colored. And um, James Logan really was quite the orchestrator of, of what 
proved to be a taking of more land from the Lenni Lenape people than they believed had been part of, had ever happened or had been part of an earlier treaty. And so what happened is um, three runners um, set out, Edward Marshall, James Yates, and Solomon Jennings were hired. Um, and instead of going at the pace that the natives expected, they ran. And so it took um, many more acres than was, was believed might be seeded. And it's thought that Lewis Evans was actually very sympathetic to the Native American point of view in his delineation of this map. And so you see the Native American at a walk, you can tell it's a, a walking pace with a dog um, in a sad stance with its head downward. Um, and at the bottom, um, this animal here in, in a run. So the native is walking away, literally visually capturing the displacement and, the, and this kind of taking of this piece of land and the kind of triumphant um, cat um, looking like very regal and mm -hmm. maybe part of a, a, a um, royal armorial kind really of interesting, really symbolism. Interesting. And Logan was very much someone who saw himself as part of the British Empire and that this is this is very much part of this colonial imperial um, project that he helped to lead. So as, as Lee takes away the walking purchase map, we're going to turn to the third generation and um, Deborah Norris Logan, who um, came to live at Stenton after her marriage to George in um, the 1780s and her friend John Fanning Watson, who started to visit her beginning in 1823 and um, would come and regularly come for tea. And she would um, kind of regale him with stories, impress him with family relics, furniture that was in the house, like a chair and an empty clock case. We now have on loan um, papers from James Logan, and in some cases also Isaac Norris, but she found a cache of Logan papers. Mm -hmm. And from the description, we think it's in this upper cupboard in a passage between the best parlor and the back lodging room um, where she found these things. So Watson literally came as someone hungry for historical experience mm -hmm. when he came to visit Deborah Logan. And um, so here we are looking at um, a volume of Watson's Annals of Philadelphia. And this was actually a book that he published in 1830 as this one big fat volume. But there are two manuscript volumes, mm -hmm. one here at HSP and one next door mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. Library Company of Philadelphia. And so he, um, this is actually his very own um, copy. And as you can see, it was rebound in 1915. And there's a whole history, you know, to how um, how things come to a collection like this, how they're cared for over time. Um, so the rebinding is really part of the history of this mm -hmm. book. But I wanted to specifically mention that the library company's copy of Watson's Annals has been taken apart mm -hmm. for the sake of preservation. So the pages are all flat in folders oh, and boxes. Yeah. And um, there's something especially wonderful mm -hmm. about continuing to experience this as a book. Yep. Um, so I think this is so great that this is intact. Um, and here's Watson himself again in the book and his, um, his, own, his very own title page still predating the um, printed publication, 1829. And I should also mention that Deborah Logan helped literally write this book. Mm. And um, there are space uh, things that letters that she wrote that are that are let in mm -hmm. in the library company's um, manuscript panels or even actual oh, she really? wrote in the book. Wow. And she was really um, not happy about not being credited in the printed mm -hmm. volume, as you can imagine, yeah. and um, complained about putting her documents to the, in the press cupboard. Men get to press. I put my my publications in my in my yeah. press cupboard in my room. So. Yeah. Um, it was not easy being um, an intellectually minded woman in this yeah. time period. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just going to give you a little bit of a, a flavor for these annals, which Watson considered this to be a museum. And it is full of not only descriptions, 
Um, and it always amuses me when I open the beginning part too, because the tops of the pages just say miscellaneous facts. Uh -huh. Like the rest, of, we could not get away today with writing 55 pages of miscellaneous right. random facts, but that's how he approached um, this as a historical endeavor. But I just wanted to show, this is Deborah Logan's um, a description of the interior of a house. Um, and it's just kind of let in here for us to see. And let's turn okay. to the next. And here's Watson's, um, he's, he's sort of taking a catalog, essentially, probably when he visits Deborah Logan of Loganian papers, mm -hmm. um, he's calling them. And we'll turn to the third, third terming. Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is where you get the sense of this being full of other artifacts wow. and really being a museum. These are Mescianza, um, okay. this party that took place during the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War, British um, officers and elite Philadelphia mm -hmm. ladies. And so these are some of the um, silks and dresses that were worn samples. And then this one is actually a silk um, supposedly made from silkworms that Reuben Haynes's daughter at Wick um, created. Oh so my gosh. In German, oh gosh. that's a Germantown family as well. And because, um, Watson lived in Germantown. There's also a a Germantown centric kind of approach to um, some of this collecting. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful piece right there. I know. Just amazing. Just amazing. It is amazing. It's Damas Cleaves. Mm -hmm. So we're, we um, we're going to turn to a small volume, and this is. Um, I can't, I, I don't know how to totally capture my excitement about this, but for years, I've wanted to find the first sketch of Stenton that um, I knew existed. It was by Watson. I had known it through um, the thesis of a former um, student at Winterthur Museum, did his thesis on Stenton in the late 1960s, Ray Shepard, who's now um, now no longer um, in this world, so I couldn't ask him. Um, but he didn't footnote a, a volume or a page. He simply published this in his thesis and just said it's at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I thought that this program, for sure, that we could come and find this. And we almost didn't. This almost morning. didn't. Uh, Steve Smith gets to the credit for finding it this morning. Yes. So this is not in the collection with many of the other Watson's right. annals. This was later collected by um, a 19th century antiquarian named Dreer by oh, last yes. name. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, Ferdinand Dreer. Ferdinand Dreer. And so, um, and this is specific, this whole volume is devoted to Germantown. So you're seeing some um, early architecture, including the now recreated Delaplane House on Market Square. And here is Fenton. And so I just, I can't, I, this is just amazing. That we, yeah. <laughs> we're always finding amazing things yeah. um, at HSP. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you can see it doesn't have. It originally had a cupola and it originally had a pediment over the door. Um, those things were gone by this time. And there's this balustrade um, at the hip of the roof that's no longer there anymore either. So it helps to capture an right. early future. Yeah. It's like a. Every day is a you know kind of a surprise and a treasure <laughs> what you find at HSP even after all these years. Um, you know I didn't actually see those fabric uh, swatches in the uh, Logan book before, so it's really it's a treasure for me to to uh, to discover these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, and so for those of you interested in textiles, in addition to what we showed you in that in the Watson's annals, I forgot to I was going to also mention um, the Logan ledger is just a treasure trove of his. Um, his trade as well. And there's a lot of textile trade that went on there. So just a little bit about, um, again, about more about the relationship between Deborah Logan and John Fanning Watson. And um, Lee is pulling out one of the volumes of Deborah Logan's diaries. There are 17 of those diaries here at HSP and one at the Library Company of Philadelphia that was almost lost in a taxi cab in the 1990s by its donors, but thankfully was, was reclaimed. 
Um, and here we're turning to um, a sort of special scene that took place in um, July 20th, 1825, when um, Lafayette is visiting Germantown as part of his triumphal tour of the nation. And David was talking earlier about the um, HSP's founding mm -hmm. in 1824 um, as well. Yep. And, um, and then we're also, they then were also looking to this anniversary of the country as we are looking to another anniversary of the country. So memory um, and sort of commemoration is such um, an important kind of impetus in times Absolutely. like then and now. Absolutely. Um, but we knew, I knew from this diary, I had seen this entry before that um, Deborah Logan received a relic box from Watson and she talks about it here. John Eddowes and his sister Caddy, Kitty um, and my friend Watson drank tea with me in the afternoon. The latter presented me with a box made of four different kinds of relic woods, remarkable for their localities. One, a piece of mahogany from a board of that kind used in building Columbus's, and she calls him the world seeking Genoese <laughs> house, still preserved with veneration at Haiti. Another piece of the treaty elm. We had an agreeable afternoon, she says. Um, but Watson in his printed writing kind of enumerated out these other woods as well, that this is turned from um, walnut, that a tree of Penn's age that stood outside the state house. There's gum, um, there's oak from a bridge mm. over Dock Creek. Mm. So um, we know that he made probably about 25 or 26 of these oh, altogether. Wow. Uh -huh. And um, David also mentioned in his introduction um, about the solicitation of papers from Deborah Logan for the nascent mm -hmm. HSP. And we were speculating downstairs whether, um, because Watson is, is part of this, whether this was also part of warming her up uh -huh. for this visit that might come about a month later uh -huh. um, or so to hopefully collect some papers um, from her. Well, they also uh, made her the first uh, uh, female member, the first woman to be a member of the historical society. So I don't know whether that was part of the deal or they recognized her own interest in history and just thought she would be a valuable member in her own right. That's true. Let's hope for the latter. Let's hope for the latter. <laughs> I know it happened in 1827, so it took a little, uh, you took, know, a couple yeah, years, yeah, but yeah. yeah, I'm glad you're remembering that. And we have, um, I was talking about our, our Dinah Memorial Project, and you're seeing a slide of um, a plaque erected to her in 1912 in Stenton Park um, by the Colonial Danes, the Site and Relic Society of Germantown, now the Germantown Historical Society, and private subscribers. And it seems maybe that um, descendant Albanus Logan, who lived at a nearby house called Loudon in Germantown with his sister Mariah Dickinson Logan, may have been a bit of an instigator um, in, in the memorializing of Dinah for saving the house. And so we've been involved in a, a project to build a new memorial to mm -hmm. Dinah in recent mm -hmm. years Excellent. and a, a project for community engagement around this work. And as part of our research, we we're really hoping to find out when Dinah was born mm -hmm. and died. We still haven't found out precisely when she was born. We think she um, was very likely born um, at the Emlyn family plantation, mm -hmm. which may have been in Southern New Jersey mm -hmm. and could have even been similar in um, birth year to Hannah Emlyn William Logan's wife oh. and served as her personal mm -hmm. um, worker. And but what, one of the most, again, another moment where you're you're in this crowded room mm -hmm. of, of readers and mm -hmm. you're thinking, I really just want to cheer out loud and, and can't believe yes, we found yes. something so amazing. Yeah. But on a, really on looking for a needle in a haystack, we came to look at these Deborah Logan pocket almanacs in mm -hmm. the Belfield collection. Mm -hmm. And um, what we were, um, we were just seeing, um, going, you know, paging through these. And this particular one is um, missing its front page that tells you what year it is. So uh -huh, you have uh -huh. to do some research to figure this out. 
But February 21st at about three o'clock in the afternoon, our very faithful and good old Dinah breathed her last, was buried the 23rd in my garden. She had requested this during her, her lifetime to be interred at Stenton. I'm sorry, requested during her lifetime to be interred mm -hmm. at Stenton. Mm -hmm. And um, just taking that in and, and, and finding her actual death date, finding that she had made a request um, to be buried at Stenton, which was honored by Deborah Logan, is just um, another one of those great archives moments. You just it, it really it really is and i remember uh, you first showed this to me two days ago and it literally stopped me i i think we were i just started going oh and ah and other sort of uh, very you know just words because i couldn't get i couldn't uh, really grasp what i was looking at and how rare it is to find something this descriptive on, on dealing with a death of somebody who who was enslaved and then you said uh, uh, emancipated that uh, just towards the end it's just amazing. And um, and again, just what a treasure. And a treasure for you and your your researchers for also finding it. Mm -hmm. And I think you said you found it just before the pandemic. We yeah. did, we did, yeah, yeah. Just before things shut down in 2020. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what a, what a treat. Part of the, the thing I think is to say about it too is just um, African-American history is part of all of, oh, all of history and it's here. Yeah. And it's not necessarily called out in the finding aids. Um, that's right. But it's all here. That's right. Um, that's to right. be found. Right. That's one of the things we're trying to do at the Historical Society is really, um, if you want to you know, call out or or to document or to highlight uh, communities that have traditionally been under documented and under focused on, either either just by neglect or by intent, unfortunately. And so um, this is some of the things that we're doing at. We're dealing with, uh, you know, recording uh, information dealing with the poor and widows and orphans. I always say the things that the Bible always tells you to take care of, right? Um, and also for um, early African American history as well, where we're doing some transcriptions uh, dealing with, um, uh, you know, sort of mini censuses um, in the city dealing with African Americans. It's because I said that's it's hard to find, and uh, you need to really establish it and call it out and celebrate it, mm -hmm. celebrate it. Uh, once you find it, you know, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in um, for all of this, and um, just to wrap up, that you can you can visit us on our web pages at hsp.org and at stenton.org, where you can discover news stories. And I would especially encourage you if you're interested in Dinah and the Dinah Memorial. We have a whole page on the Stenton web site devoted to that um, and so please you know ask away if there are any questions um, we'd be delighted to well i'll, I'll just start off with one yeah is um the lovely relic of relic box yeah what would we call that today uh would we call it a, a trinket box or was it made for something else is it was it made for women was it made for men what is it? yeah most of them were given to men mm -hmm. um other men who were involved with um, Watson and others in this society for celebrating the, mm -hmm. the Society for William Penn, yeah. I think just commonly called the Penn Society. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know of any others that women received mm -hmm. other than Deborah Logan, mm -hmm. but uh, they seem to be called snuff boxes mm -hmm. in the period and whether they really use them for that or not. This one does not smell like tobacco. Now, a woman wouldn't use snuff <laughs> back then. I don't know if a woman would use snuff today either, but uh, but uh, but we don't know. But it's it's just it's so beautiful, and I like sort of the history of the trees. You know whether it truly came from this tree next to where Columbus set his foot in the sand. I don't know, but it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely just wonderful that that's the tradition and that's how they want to uh, describe it. That's well, great. and Deborah Logan did put some um, seals, wax seals, from oh. people in the family, and I, I actually took them out to bring it down here because uh -huh. they're a little bit fragile. But they, they get very crumbly. They, yes. Yeah. Um, so she had, she used it as she considered it a kind of commemorative. Oh, wonderful! Box. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. 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 So we have some questions yeah. from the Q and A. Great. Um, Jack is asking, didn't Deborah expunge some papers that didn't show the family in a favorable light? 
she did do that. Mm. Um, and I don't know a ton about that. I don't remember if in this particular volume of the diary, I know some of the ones um, have a lot of crossed out oh, sections yes, as that. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so she literally edited herself quite a bit when she might express things that she didn't want to have go on for um, common knowledge into the posterity that she referred to. Um, but particularly, I would, I would turn, um, suggest you look at Gary Nash's book, mm -hmm. Her City on Forging Memory. There's a, a set, whole section in there about Deborah Logan and um, um, editing, editing herself. Yeah. I, I think you mentioned Loudon earlier. How is that related to Logan? Yeah, so I, I should have said, there are so many different papers collections here that relate to Stenton. So there's the, the Logan collection, um, the other related families, the Norris, the Smith, the Fishers, um, but these Belfield papers, there, and there's a whole big Loudon collection as well. So Loudon was another historic, it became a historic house museum near Stenton, um, lived in by later generations um, of Logans in the 19th century, and sort of perhaps famously for some still, Mariah Dickinson Logan and her brother Albanus, um, neither of whom had children and they had a sister, Fanny, um, who died at the end of the 19th century. So there were no issue, no children from this generation and this line of the family. And they had a lot of things which they gave to other organizations. Some, the Logan Ledger, there's mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. suggestion that it um, may have come through Loudon as well. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, although this almanac was in the Belfield papers mm -hmm. that it has a Loudon stamp in the front. and. Um, so it's a, it's a house that is owned by Fairmont Park, um, part of the park houses, and has been closed since a fire in 1993, but it's in Lower Germantown mm -hmm. on um, Germantown Avenue. And you can visit the park and wander around the house. Oh, that's interesting, interesting. I, I did a, a tour and I remember you when we went to Stenton, there was a, uh, I'm also a Philadelphia tour guide and we had a bus tour of Germantown of the, for the tour guide so that they could explain it better to our tourists. And um, and so we went through a lot of the houses going up when we started off at Stenton. It was wonderful. It was all nice. Did you tell the full story of Dinah and the I Revolutionary did War? I did just not. Sort of make sure, sure we capture that. I can capture that. And, and um, actually, it's funny because this story definitely came down in the family. I should, you know, there's a whole sort of um, understanding of how the story evolved over the 19th century. And there's some information about that also on our, our Dinah page. Um, Deborah Logan first recorded it without using the name Dinah in her manuscript that's here in the Loudon Papers, um, Reminiscences of George Logan. Um, and she simply re refers to her as kind of an old domestic and this saving of the house. And then Watson published, um, it doesn't appear in the first edition of the annals, but the second one, which I'm trying to remember if it's, uh, it's still before he dies, I think. There's a passing reference to it again, not using her name. Um, but what, what evolves over time and is in some of the local Germantown histories is this story that the idea almost that Dinah was alone, which you've also learned probably not true, um, in November of 1777. And the story goes like this. A couple of, um, of British soldiers um, come up to the house and, and she's there. They knock on the door and they say, um, ma'am, we're here to burn the house down. Do you have anything we can use for fuel? Oh my. And she says, well, there's some hay out in the oh, barn. Oh, oh, oh. oh, what do I do next? Right. And yeah, yeah. they go off to the barn. Um, and a very short while later, a couple of British officers come riding up the drive and um, they say, ma'am, we're here looking for deserters from our army. Have you seen any of our men? And she directs them to the barn where they arrest their own men. And Stenton is therefore saved by her oh quick gosh. thinking and presence of mind. Excellent. Excellent. So that's the story. And, and it, um, it got typed up in a, it's in this historic house committee sort of manuscript notebook at uh -huh. Stenton in, in, from 1906. So the Danes were telling this story, I think really from the beginning and hence also the, the plaque and this idea of Dinah as a preserver of this place as well as honoring that. 
mentioned that they even sort of used that word they referred to as a caretaker or or that was that was one of the they the, did the references yeah so the plaque describes her as a faithful colored caretaker of course a word again of its time yep, yep. um but i found it so fascinating when we discovered the almanac reference that calls out our faithful mm -hmm. Um, Dinah as well. And this kind of sense with this Watson, Deborah Logan generation that the colonial, they were born in colonial times and it merges with the colonial revival and there's almost a continuum, if you mm -hmm. will, um, mm -hmm. in, in the way that the history is presented through their eyes. Yeah. yeah. People were really excited about the walking purchase map seeing that yeah a couple of questions again the animals that were on it oh yeah and is the cat a british lion um yeah it's unclear whether it's 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 definitely a cat i'm gonna call it a, a generic feline a feline like creature <laughs> um but it, it you know you could maybe even mistake it for a kind of um there are local cats or a, a nittany lion if you will um so but i think it is an allusion to that empirical, or excuse me, imperial um, cat in the kind of the British royal arms and that kind of thing. And there was a dog. Yes, the dog is with the Indian. And um, trying to remember if the second creature is also a dog. And I, I forgot to also mention that a really nice and brief write up about this map, and, I, and then it may have been shared in the chat, can be found in. Um, it, um, Margaret Pritchard's book chapter called A Protracted View in a book that was published in 2011 by Yale Press called Knowing Nature. Ooh. And um, so the, and that's edited by Amy R.W. Myers. And so Margaret has a, she talks about the dog's head hung low, walking away from the tract um, as if literally walking out in the picture. Um, and the lower left, also, it's also a dog, she yeah. says, a lower left, a running dog alludes to the accelerated speed of the walking party. And finally, the figure of a leopard or mountain lion in the upper right assumes a heraldic pose that reflects the pen's dominance over the land as well as over the indigenous population. That's, that's really interesting. For all the years I've looked at that map, um, I never heard of an interpretation of it other than just it was, you know, the mountains are mountains and the, the water is a water. And uh, that's, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. We have uh, questions about objects yes. as well, because you brought us objects here at yes. HSB. Apart from Deborah Logan, do we know anyone else who received artifacts or who supplied artifacts to Watson? who supplied artifacts to Watson. And or other information, the way she gave him documents. Yeah. Um, a lot, I'm sure a lot of people supplied the information and I can't say I know tons about the specifics, but I know he was, he was um, really interested in old people, basically, because they could all <laughs> serve as oral history sources. <laughs> so he does a lot of interviewing and first, first um, you know, first person, um recording of history and um his his books are really amazing because he's also an early preservationist he's going and creating line drawings of many buildings he collects early prints of buildings one of the little volumes i looked at briefly in the reading room this morning was just full of wonderful little prints that i didn't even have time to look at all the all mm -hmm. the sourcing for them and i even wondered if some of his line drawings might actually be taken from these prints, whether he wasn't necessarily looking at the building, as I would have assumed that he's he's actually uh, yes, uh -huh. looking at the prints. Um, but similar to those drawings we showed on the same page with the, mm -hmm. the stent, and some of them are even more kind of unfilled in than, than that. Mm -hmm. um, other objects given to him. I know when he died, and in a, in a chapter I wrote that you might also have in the, um, in the chat, and I'm here with our colleagues, Justina and Rachel Horma from Stenton and Chris um, here from HSP behind the scenes. They're doing, they're making all of this work yes. and funneling these things to you. But there's, um, in the chapter I wrote toward the end is a description of Watson on his deathbed, which was published elsewhere. And um, 
it includes some of the things that are around him, like um, pictures of buildings in relic wood frames and um, a chair and an empty clock case we now have on loan at Stenton, the desk and bookcase, the English desk and bookcase that's in the Logan room of the library company mm -hmm. next door um, and was passed along to Watson. Um, as well as like Battle of Germantown um, artillery. Yes, yeah, right. no, <laughs> yeah. yes. So all kinds of things like that. And I, I, I think he would, you know, endear himself to people and ask for things. And that's mm -hmm. certainly what he, how his relationship with Deborah Logan operated. And there's um, some good documentation about this chair she gave it to him that she had it fixed first. Um, because she was concerned that if she didn't, his wife would think it was a piece of old trumpery, uh, you know, not want to keep it. So, could you just describe what provenance means? It's in your title. It's in our oh, title yeah. Of so, programs. provenance is this idea of the, it's almost, um, I think in a way, it's like the, the history of something as it comes down over time. So, and if the pro, I want to actually call out the provenance of this relic wood box that's at Stenton um, because it came to us um, through a really fun um, and surprise way. And I think actually one of the people who gave it to us is maybe on the call. And um, her mother, Rosemary Crawford and Meg Hooper uh, and my husband and I were all having coffee in a hotel in Oxford. And this is more than 10 years ago. And, and Meg had been in touch about um, actually some pocket almanacs that they had and um, they were thinking of giving to Stenton and we're just having a, a nice chat over this coffee. And um, the mother and daughter kind of look at each other like, should we, did you tell her about the box or uh -huh. should we tell her about the box? And like this box comes out of a pocketbook. And um, I had known that the box existed from the diary entry, but I never, I never ever thought I would see this box and I'd seen there's one in the Germantown Historical Society that probably was Watson's own. There's one he gave to Reuben Haynes in the collection at Wick. And so I knew what it would look like. Um, and this was just st a stunning gift to receive um, for Stenton. And so it came down through their line of the family. Um, and yeah, there's a whole nine generations of ownership that that kind of go into many of the things that um, we document that that history of given to and given to and given to. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, people are interested in the ledger. Do we know that Logan wrote those entries in the ledger or is that a Scrivener? Yeah, I, if, if we had had more time to look at more pages, um, many of the entries are written by um, probably a clerk or clerks. But very, very often you can see Logan's own hand at the bottom when the counts are being reconciled or that he's adding things in. And he has this very sort of tiny, tight, distinctive writing um, as if he's just making sure it's all right in the end. He's definitely had his eyes and hands all over that ledger, but he didn't do all the, the scribing. And I suspect that the names of the accounts that are in that sort of very, um, kind of florid script are, are various clerks and, and so forth and not, they don't seem to be his hand. A couple more questions. Is there a connection between Loudoun and Loudoun County in Virginia? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest. You don't know everything? No. <laughs> do, do you know, or maybe late, do you know, are there any documents regarding the Great Spring Tract? Because Will directed the quit rents from that tract um directed them in the Loganian library do you mean anything the about the great spring, spring track, track? No. I, I mean it just sounds like um a track. I wonder if it has to do with spring garden just because I feel like maybe and this is really digging in my brain for stuff that I don't know where it comes from whether there was land in spring garden that was sort of um any income that that was generating in terms of farming and um care whether that was producing money for the Loganian library I'm not sure it's something someone else could could try and find um when you back to your Loudon thing though people often mistake this loud in the house is spelled l-o-u-d-o-u-n oh. and isn't the county l-o-u-d 
It's not the same. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All right, we're just about ready to wrap up. One more question here. This is a little fun one. Is there any truth to the story that the number of N's in your spelling of Pennsylvania betrayed your political <coughs> allegiance? I have never heard that. Has no, anyone ever no, heard that? Have I. All right, well, if anyone has heard that, they can put it in the chat that the way you spelled Pennsylvania, as we saw in the ledger, had a political meaning. Interesting. I do not know. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, even some of our earlier maps, it says this is the improved part of Pennsylvania, a map of the improved part of Pennsylvania. It has one N. And I I didn't know why I just thought just like just like me, maybe people weren't good spellers back then. I don't know. Uh, but maybe it did have something more uh more pointed yeah. uh, to it. But certainly maybe. spelling was not, you know, not regularized throughout the 18th century necessarily. Yeah. And I don't know when Pennsylvania took on its regular. I don't know. Yeah. You know, and I know because you know King Charles II wanted to make sure that it was called Pennsylvania after William Penn's father, also known as William Penn. And so you would think it would be the double M, you know, like it's really clear, right? You know, it's this is the person it's named after. Um uh and my silly interpretation is that Charles II is like the debt is settled, all right? We're done. You have Pennsylvania. Um, and but uh, but again, the early spellings just had one, and I don't know if that was Penn's way of saying, I'm just gonna mess with you. I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you so much. For, thank you, Joan. You're thank the one. You. I was sitting here, I'm part of the audience, actually. I'm just listening to you and 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 watching these things and just mesmerize myself. So I want to thank you so much for coming. I know uh, David and I are just really excited about this, Justina. Of course, I, I'm looking two different ways at once, but Justina, <laughs> trust me, she's over there who we'll organized this, and Chris, just uh, you know, giving us all the uh, all the ways to make this um, actually enjoyable, hopefully for all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you.